Hello, everyone. This is book three or volume three of the commentaries on the Constitution. Kind of skipping ahead here. This is quite far into it. Chapter, what is that, 44? And it starts with section 1851. It has to do with the amendments to the Constitution. I thought it'd be a beneficial for us to go over this to actually know why it wasn't originally added what it's all about and to help get a better sense of what our rights are in this country you might be surprised and father willing if everyone's okay we'll go back to the beginning and start with book one and learn how our government was supposed to function and how it was functioning after it was first created <clears throat> So this says, we have already had occasion to take notice of some of the amendments made to the Constitution subsequent to its adoption in the progress of our review of the provisions of the original instrument. The present chapter will be devoted to a consideration of those which have not fallen within the scope of our former commentaries. It has been already stated that many objections were taken to the Constitution, not only on account of its actual provisions, but also on account of its deficiencies and omissions. Among the latter, none were proclaimed with more zeal and pressed with more effect than the want of a Bill of Rights. <clears throat> this, it was said, was a fatal defect insufficient of itself to bring on the ruin of the Republic. To this objection, several answers were given. First, that the Constitution did in fact contain many provisions in the nature of a Bill of Rights, if the whole Constitution was not in fact a Bill of Rights. Secondly, that a Bill of Rights was, in its nature, more adapted to a monarchy than to a government professedly founded upon the will of the people, and executed by their immediate representatives and agents. And thirdly, that a formal Bill of Rights beyond what was contained in it was wholly unnecessary, and might even be dangerous. And you can see the footnotes here. He's addressing as we go. I'm not going to read them off or anything, but you can pause and check them out. The first answer was supported by reference to the clauses in the Constitution, providing for the judgment in cases of impeachment, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, the trial by jury in, in criminal cases. And this is important for when they try to have traffic infractions that they call criminal. You can demand trials by jury. And according to the Constitution, not by their fiat six-man juries, right? That's something for later. The definition, trial, and punishment of treason the prohibition of bills of attainder, ex post facto laws, laws impairing the obligation of contracts, laws granting titles of nobility, and laws imposing religious tests. All these were so many declarations of rights for the protection of the citizens, not exceeded in value by any which could possibly find a place in any Bill of Rights. <clears throat> Upon the second point, it was said that bill of, Bills of Rights are in their origin stipulations between kings and their subjects, abridgments of prerogative in favor of privilege, and reservations of rights not surrendered to the prince. Such was Magna Charta, obtained by the baron's sword in hand of King John. Such were the subsequent confirmations of that charter by succeeding princes. Such was the petition of right assented to by Charles I 
in the beginning of his reign. Such also was the declaration of rights presented by the Lords and Commons to the Prince of Orange in 1688, and afterwards put into form, or put into the form of an act of Parliament called the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> It is evident, therefore, that according to its primitive signification, a Bill of Rights has no application to constitutions professedly founded upon the power of the people and executed by persons who are immediately chosen by them to execute their will. In our country, in strictness, the people surrender nothing Pay attention to that. And as they retain everything, they have no need of particular reservations. Quote, We the people of the United States, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Unquote is a better recognition of popular rights than volumes of those aphorisms, which make a principal figure in several of our state bills of rights, and which would sound much better in a trustee of ethics than in a constitution of government. Upon the third point, it was said that a minute detail of particular rights was certainly far less applicable to a constitution designed to regulate the general political concerns of the nation than to one which had the regulation of every species of personal and private concerns, meaning a Bill of Rights would be more particular for a constitution that covered the government of all peoples and things, instead of just the government of our elected officials. But because it was minute and limited in scope, with finite information for the limited powers we were delegating to them there was no need it says but it was added the argument might justly be carried further it might be affirmed that a bill of rights in the sense and extent which is contended for was not only wholly unnecessary but it might even be dangerous such a bill of would contain various exceptions to powers not granted, and on the ver this very account might afford a colorable pretext to claim more than was granted, for why it might be asked to declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do. Why, for instance, that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed. It is true that upon sound reasoning a declaration of this sort could not fairly be construed to imply a regulating power, but it might be seized upon by men disposed to usurpation. Exactly what we have going on. In order to furnish a plausible pretense for claiming the power, they might urge with a semblance of reason that the Constitution ought not to be charged with the absurdity of providing against an abuse of an authority which was not given, and that the provision against restraining the liberty of the press afforded a clear implication that a right to prescribe proper regulation, regulations concerning it was intended to be vested in the national government. What we see with the usurpation of our rights with the Second Amendment, for example, the prime thing that they're doing, they have no right, shall not be infringed, was just that, not touching it. But by enumerating that, they give it this quasi-legitimacy for their contrivances that, of usurpation to come up with things that infringe on it. It's past time we got over these things, gentlemen.
It was further added that in truth, the Constitution itself was in every rational sense and to every useful purpose a Bill of Rights for the Union. It specifies and declares the political privileges of the citizens in the structure and administration of the government. It defines certain immunities and modes of proceeding, which relate to their personal, private, and public rights and concerns. It confers on them the unalienable right of electing their rulers and prohibits any tyrannical measures and vindictive prosecutions, so that at best much of the force of the objection rests on mere nominal, nominal distinctions or upon a desire to make a frame of government a code to regulate rights and remedies. Although it must be conceded that there is much intrinsic force in this reasoning, it cannot in candor be admitted to be wholly satisfactory or conclusive on the subject. It is rather the argument of an able advocate than the reasoning of a constitutional statesman. In the first place, a Bill of Rights, in the very sense of this reasoning, is admitted in some cases to be important, and the Constitution itself adopts and establishes its propriety to the extent of its actual provisions. Every reason which establishes the propriety of any provision of this sort in the Constitution, such as a right of trial by jury in criminal cases, is pro tanto, proof that is neither unnecessary nor dangerous. It reduces the question to the consideration not whether any Bill of Rights is necessary, but what such a Bill of Rights should properly contain. That is a point for argument upon which different minds may arrive at different conclusions. That a Bill of Rights may contain too many enumerations, and especially such as more correctly belong to the ordinary legislation of a government, cannot be doubted. Some of our state Bills of Rights contain clauses of this description, being either in their character and phraseology quite too loose and general and ambiguous, or covering doctrines quite debatable both in theory and practice, or even leading to mischievous consequences by restricting the legislative power under circumstances which were not foreseen. And if foreseen, the restraint would have been pronounced by all persons inexpedient and perhaps unjust. Indeed, the rage of theorists to make constitutions a vehicle for the conveyance of their own crude and visionary of aphorisms of government requires to be guarded against with the most unceasing vigilance. In the next place, a Bill of Rights is important and may often be indispensable whenever it operates as a qualification upon powers actually granted by the people to the government. This is the real ground of all the bills of rights to or in the parent country, in the colonial constitutions and laws, and in the state constitutions. In England, the bills of rights were not demanded merely of the crown, as withdrawing a power from the royal prerogative, they were equally important as withdrawing power from Parliament. A large portion of the most valuable of the provisions in Magna Charta, or Carta, and the Bills of, or Bill of Rights in 1688 consists of a solemn recognition of limitations upon the power of Parliament, that is, a declaration that Parliament ought not to abolish or restrict those rights. Such are the rights of trial by jury, the right to personal liberty and private property according to the law of the land, that the subjects ought to have a right to bear arms, that elections of members of Parliament ought to be free, 
that freedom of speech and debate in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned elsewhere, and that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel or unusual punishments inflicted. Whenever then a general power exists or is granted to a government which may in its actual exercise or abuse be dangerous to the people, there seems a peculiar propriety in restricting its operations and in accepting from it some at least of the most mischievous forms in which it may be likely to be abused. And the very exception in such cases will operate with a silent but irresistible influence to control the actual abuse of it in other analogous, er, analogous, analogous cases. In the next place, a Bill of Rights may be important, even when it goes beyond powers supposed to be granted. It is not always possible to foresee the extent of the actual reach of certain powers, which are given in general terms. They may be construed to extend, and perhaps fairly, to certain classes of cases, which did not at first appear to be within them. A Bill of Rights then operates as a guard upon any extravagant or undue extension of such powers, Besides, as has been justly remarked, a Bill of Rights is of real efficiency in controlling the excesses of party spirit. It serves to guide and enlighten public opinion and to render it more quick to detect and more resolute to resist attempts to disturb private rights. It requires more than ordinary hardihood and audacity of character to trample down principles which our ancestors have consecrated with reverence, which we imbibed in our early education, which recommend themselves to the judgment of the world by their truth and simplicity. And you can see why they went to ruin our education and to mess with our culture so that this was not passed down to further generations. And which are constantly placed before the eyes of the people, accompanied with the imposing force and solemnity of a constitutional sanction. Bills of rights are a part of the munitions of freemen. Min muniments of freemen, excuse me. It's the... Uh, Muniments, it's the, the things that you have, the gifts in hand, right? Showing their title of, to protection, and they become of increased value when placed under the protection of an independent judiciary instituted as the appropriate guardian of the republic, or sorry, of the public and private rights of the citizens. In the next place, it has been urged within much earnestness, a Bill of Rights is an important protection against unjust and oppressive conduct on the part of the people themselves. In a government modified like that of the United States, said a great statesman, the great danger lies rather in the abuse of the community than in the legislative body. The prescriptions in favor of liberty ought to be leveled against that quarter where the greatest danger lies, namely, that which possesses the highest prerogative of power. But this is not found in the executive or legislative departments of government, but in the body of the people, operating by the majority against the minority. It may be thought that all paper barriers against the power of the community are too weak to be worthy of attention. They are not so strong as to satisfy all who have seen and examined thoroughly the texture of such a defense. Yet as they have a tendency to impress some degree of respect for them, to establish the public opinion in their favor, and to rouse the attention of the whole community, 
it may be one means to control the majority from those acts to which they might be otherwise inclined. In regard to another suggestion that the affirmance of certain rights might disparage others, or might lead to argumentative implications in favor of other powers, it might be sufficient to say that such a course of reasoning could never be sustained upon any solid basis, and it could never furnish any just ground of objection, that ingenuity might pervert or usurpation overleap the true sense. That objection will equally lie against all powers, whether large or limited, whether national or state, whether in a bill of rights or in a frame of government. But a conclusive answer is that such an attempt may be interdicted, as it has been, by a positive declaration in such a Bill of Rights, that the enumeration Ooh, excuse me. All right. Sorry about that. It says, but a positive declaration in such a Bill of Rights that the enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights or others retained by the people. The want of a Bill of Rights, then, is not either an unfounded or illusionary objection. The real question is not whether every sort of right or privilege or claim ought to be affirmed in a constitution but whether such as in their own nature are of vital importance and particularly susceptible to abuse ought not to receive this solemn sanction. Doubtless the want of a formal Bill of Rights in the Constitution was a matter of very exaggerated declamation and party zeal for the mere purpose of defeating the Constitution but so far as the objection was well-founded, in fact, it was right to remove it by subsequent amendments, and Congress have, as we shall see, accordingly performed the duty with most prompt and laudable diligence. Let us now enter upon the consideration of the amendments which it will be found principally regard subjects properly belonging to a Bill of Rights. The first is, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition government for redress of grievances. Unquote. And first, the prohibition of any establishment of religion and the freedom of religious opinion and worship. How far any government has a right to interfere in matters touching religion has been a subject much discussed by writers upon public and political law. The right and the duty of the interference of government in matters of religion have been maintained by many distinguished authors, as well those who were the warmest advocates of free governments, as those who were attached to governments of a more arbitrary character. Indeed, the right of a society or government to interfere in matters of religion will hardly be contested by any persons who believe that piety, religion, and morality are intimately connected with the well-being of the state and indispensable to the administration of civil justice. The promulgation of the great doctrines of religion 
the being and attributes and providence of one almighty L, the responsibility to him for all our actions founded upon moral freedom and accountability, a future state of rewards and punishments, the cultivation of all the personal, social, and benevolent virtues. These never can be a matter of indifference to any well-ordered community. It is indeed difficult to conceive how any civilized society can well exist without them. And at all events, it is impossible for those who believe in the truth of the scriptures as a as Elohim's revelation, to doubt that it is the especial duty of government to foster and encourage it among all the citizens and subjects, which is actually law in our land where they encourage education. Education was always about the study of scripture, contrary to what we have going on now. This is a point wholly distinct from that of the right of private judgment in matters of religion and of the freedom of public worship according to the dictates of one's conscience. The real difficulty lies in ascertaining the limits to which government may rightfully go in fostering and encouraging religion. Three cases may easily be sus supposed. One, where a government affords aid to a particular religion, leaving all persons free to adopt any other. Another, where it creates an ecclesiastical establishment for the propagation of the doctrines of a particular sect of that religion, leaving a like freedom to all others. And a third, where it creates such an establishment and excludes all persons not belonging to it, either wholly or in part from any participation in the public honors, trusts, emoluments, privileges, and immunities of the state. For instance, a government may simply declare that the Christian religion shall be the religion of the state and shall be aided and encouraged in all its varieties of sects belonging to it, or it may declare that the Catholic or Protestant religion shall be the religion of the state, leaving every man to the free enjoyment of his own religious opinions. Or it may establish the doctrines of a particular sect, as of Episcopalians, as the religion of the state, with a like freedom. Or it may establish the doctrines of a particular sect as exclusively the religion of the state, tolerating others to a limited extent or excluding all not belonging to it from all public honors, trusts, emoluments, privileges, and immunities. Now, there will probably be found few persons in this or in any other Christian country, believing nation, right, who would deliberately contend that it was unreasonable or unjust to foster and encourage the believing religion generally, the Bible, the scripture, believing religion, right? They call it Christian, and I'm sorry, I, I don't use that word anymore because of its origin. It was a usurpation by Nicolaitan Catholics. It was adopted by Sixtus III as um, enforced first in the Theodosian Codex, and then in the Edict of Thessalonica, and it's in, enforced by the Sword of Rome to be called Catholic Christians, to believe in a co-equal, co-eternal trinity, and to keep the Christ Mass on December 25th, and a few other heretical things. So I don't agree with any of that stuff, and hence I don't really use that word. It was even a lie on how it came about, but that's for another time. Point being believers in the scriptures and the, the adherence to the common law, which is the Ten Commandments and the right rulings in scripture. But it says, and encourage the scriptural religion generally as a matter of sound policy as well as of revealed truth. In fact, every American colony from its foundation down to the revolution 
with the exception of Rhode Island, if indeed that state be an exception, did openly, by the whole course of its laws and institutions, support and sustain in some form the scriptural religion, and almost invariably gave a peculiar sanction to some of its fundamental doctrines. And this has continued to be the case in some of the states down to the present period without the slightest suspicion that it was against the principles of public law or republican liberty. Indeed, in a republic there would seem to be a peculiar propriety in viewing the, the scriptural religion as the great basis upon which it must rest for its support and permanence, if it be. What it has ever been deemed by its truest friends to be the religion of liberty. Montesquieu has remarked that the scriptural religion or the Nazarene religion is a stranger to mere despotic power. The mildness so frequently recommended in the good news is incomparable with the despotic rage with which a prince punishes his subjects and exercises himself in cruelty. He has gone even further and affirmed that the Protestant religion is far more congenial with the spirit of political freedom than the Catholic, which the Catholic is satanic. And unfortunately, um, that's what scripture says, come out for my people in regard to, right? It says, when, says he, the Christian religion two, century, two centuries ago became unhappily divided into Catholic and Protestant, the people of the North embraced the Protestant and those of the South still adhered to the Catholic. The reason is plain. The people of the North have and will ever have a spirit of liberty and independence which the people of the South have not, and therefore a religion which has no visible head is more agreeable to the independency of climate than that which has one. Without stopping to inquire whether this remark be well founded, it is certainly true that the parent country has acted upon it with a severe and, vil and vigilant zeal, and in most of the colonies, the same rigid jealousy has been maintained almost down to our own times. Massachusetts, while she has promulgated in her Bill of Rights the importance and necess necessity rather, of the public support of religion and the worship of Elohim, has authorized the legislature to require it only for Protestantism. The language of that Bill of Rights is remarkable for its pointed affirmation of the duty of government to support Christianity and the reasons for it. As says the third article, the happiness of a people and the good order and preservation of civil government essentially depend upon piety, religion, and morality. And these cannot be generally diffused through the community, but by the institution of the public worship of Elohim and of public instructions in piety, religion, and morality. Therefore, to promote their happiness and to secure their tov order and preservation of their government, the people of this commonwealth have a right to invest their legislature with power to authorize and require and a legislator shall from time to time authorize and require the several towns, parishes, etc., etc., to make suitable provision at their own expense for the institution of the public worship of Elohim and for the support and maintenance of public Protestant te teachers of piety, religion, and morality in all cases where such provision shall not be made voluntarily. Afterwards, there follow provisions prohibiting any superiority of one sect over another in securing to all citizens the free exercise of religion.
And that's probably more freedom in religion than any of us are familiar with today, with all the ecumenical movement and the tax-free 501c3 corporate fictions that are under government regulation, right? And Jesuit control. Probably at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and of the amendment to it, now under consideration, the general, if not the universal universal i'm sorry universal sentiment in america was that the nazarene or the christianity ought to receive encouragement from the state so far as was not incomparable or sorry incompatible with the private rights of conscience and the freedom of religious worship an attempt to level all religions and to make it a matter of state policy to hold all in utter indifference would have created universal disappropriation, if not universal indignation. And we can see that, although our, our forefathers seem to be powerless to do anything about it, in the acceptance and prevalence of Satanism and other blasphemous types of religious worship that have become normal and sanctioned again, by the usurpation of these men. It says, yet it remains a problem to be solved in men's affairs, whether any free government can be permanent, where the public worship of Elohim and the support of religion constitute no part of the policy or duty of the state in any assignable shape. And you can see the state of affairs we're actually in now because it's not done. Back in the day, the president, like Abraham Lincoln, made a proclamation of a national day of fasting and repentance, prayer and petition for the state of affairs of our country and so that reconciliation could be made. And then the war was over. So something to keep in mind. Presidents used to get proclamations for fasting, prayer, and acknowledgement of the Almighty quite often back then. And now something like that is rarely done. But even in some of our lifetimes, you might recall that in 1983 was the year of the Bible. But we'll continue. It says, The future experience of Nazarene and chiefly of the American states must settle this problem as yet new in the history of the world, abundant as it has been in experiments in the theory of government. But the duty of supporting religion, and especially the Nazarene religion, is very different from the right to force the consciences of other men, which there is no right, or to punish them for worshipping Elohim in the manner which they believe, their accountability to him requires. It has been truly said that religion, or the duty we owe to our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be dictated only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Mr. Locke himself, who did not doubt the right of government to interfere in matters of religion, and especially to encourage the Nazarene, at the same time has expressed his opinion of the right of private judgment and liberty of conscience in the manner becoming his character as a sincere friend of civil and religious liberty. Quote, No man or a society of men, says he, have any authority to impose their opinions or interpretations on any other, the meanest Nazarene, since in matters of religion, every man must know and believe and give an account for himself. Unquote. The rights of conscience are indeed beyond the just reach of any man's power. They are given by Elohim and cannot be encroached upon by man's authority without a criminal disobedience of the precepts of natural as well as revealed religion. The real object of the amendment was not 
to countenance, much less to advance Mohammedism or Judaism or infidelity by prostraining or by prostraining, sorry, prostraining Christianity, but to exclude all rivalry among the Nazarene or Christian sects and to prevent any national ecclesiastical establishment which should give to an hierarchy the exclusive patronage of the national government. It thus cut off the means of religious persecution, at least by government sanction, right, overtly. The vice and pest of former ages and of the subversion of the rights of conscience in matters of religion, which had been trampled upon almost from the days of the apostles to the present age. The history of the parent country had afforded the most solemn warnings and melancholy instructions on this head, on this subject, right? And even New England, the land of the persecuted Puritans, as well as other colonies where the Church of England had maintained its superiority, would furnish out a chapter as full as of the darkest bigotry and intolerance as any which could be found to disgrace the pages of foreign annals. Apostasy, heresy, and nonconformity had been standard crimes for public appeals to kindle the flames of persecution and apologize for the most atrocious triumphs over innocence and virtue. Mr. Justice Blackstone, after having spoken with a manly freedom of the abuses in the Romish church respecting heresy and that Christianity had been deformed by the demon of persecution upon the continent and that the island of Great Britain had not been entirely free from the scourge, defends the final enactments against nonconformity in England in the following set phrases to which, without any material change, might be justly applied to his own sac sarcastic remarks upon the conduct of the Roman ecclesiastics in punishing heresy. Quote, For nonconformity to the worship of the church, says he, there is much more to be pleaded than for the former, that is, reviling the ordinances of the church, being a matter of the private conscience, to the scruples of which our present laws have shown a very just and Nazarene indulgence. For undoubtedly all persecution and oppression of weak consciences on the score of religious persuasions are highly unjustifiable upon every principle of natural reason, civil liberty, or sound religion. But care must be taken not to carry this indulgence into such extremes, as may endanger the, the national church. There is always a difference to be made between toleration and establishment. Let it be remembered that at the very moment when the learned commentator was penning these cold remarks, the laws of England merely tolerated Protestant dissenters in public worship upon certain conditions, at once irritating and degrading that the test and corporation acts excluded them from public and corporate offices, both of trust and profit, that the learned commentator avows that the object of the test and corporation acts was to exclude them from office in common with Turks, Jews, heretics, papists, and other secretaries, that to deny the Trinity, however conscientiously disbelieved, was a public offense punishable by fine and imprisonment. And remember, if you've been following along in our their commentary of what's been going on in the scriptures and revelation and things like that, the two witnesses were typified in Martin Luther and Johann Calvin. And what they walked out in in their life was a type and shadow of the Reformation in those areas that would happen. What happened with Luther and then what happened later on in Germany is a type and shadow. And the same thing with Johann Calvin, where he persecuted uh, a nonconformist and he burnt a man at the stake for denying the Trinity, which is a satanic doctrine. 
It, it is a Nicolaitan doctrine. It is not scriptural whatsoever. There is no one equal to the Father. He's greater than our Mashiach, who is the firstborn of all creation. You can argue and fight that, but it's plainly what Scripture says. So to think otherwise is to think contrary to the truth. It's that simple. But continuing here, <clears throat> Johann Calvin, in his later, he burned a man at the stake. And you can see in that area in Britain, that was something that was prevalent amongst the people as a body politic, even though they were Protestant. You can also find witness and information of that in the Antichrist for Dummies, where the uh, the judgment, the right ruling of our Creator and Yahuwah's correction for these things was put on them because they were burning his witnesses. He ended up burning London in 1666 and also Constantinople. But to continue here, It says, however, consciously disbelieve was a public offense punishable by fine and imprisonment, and that in the rear of all these disabilities and grievances came the long list of acts against papists by which they were reduced to a state of political and religious slavery and cut off from some of the dearest privileges of mankind. It was under the solemn consciousness of the dangers from ecclesiastical ambition, the bigotry of spiritual pride, and the intolerance of sex, thus exemplified in our domestic as well as in foreign annals, that it was deemed advisable to exclude from the national government all power to act upon the subject. The situation, too, of the different states equally proclaimed the policy as well as the necessity of such an exclusion. In some of the states, Episcopalians constituted the, pre the predominant sect, in others, Presbyterians, in others, Congregationalists, in others, Quakers, and in others, again, there was a close numerical rivalry among contending sects. It was impossible that there should not arise perpetual strife and perpetual jealousy on the subject of ecclesiastical ascendancy if the national government were left free to create a religious establishment. The only security was in extra, extripating, or extirpating the power, but this alone would have been an imperfect security if it had not been followed up by a declaration of the right of the free exercise of religion and a prohibition, as we have seen, of all religious tests. Thus, the whole power over the subject of religion is left exclusively to the state governments to be acted upon according to their own sense of justice and to the and the state constitutions and the catholic and the protestant the calvinist and the armenian the jew and the infidel may sit down at the common table of the national councils without any inquisition into their faith or mode of worship the next clause of the amendment respects the liberty of the press quote Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, unquote. Oh, just a moment. So we've gone over the first one. We might go over the second one and then stop for there. We'll see what we're doing. But as you can see, the first, the reason for having it and all that it entails, it was strictly to promote the, the religion of the Bible to encourage that amongst us, but not to enforce a particular denomination. Father willing, everyone can see that. We'll go on to the next one real quick. It says, the next clause of the amendment respects the liberty of the press. And I read that already. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. 
that this amendment was intended to secure to every citizen an absolute right to speak or write or print whatever he might please without any responsibility, public or private, therefore, is a supposition too wild to be indulged by any rational man. This would be to allow to every citizen a right to destroy at his pleasure the reputation, the peace, the property, and even the personal safety of every other citizen. A man might, out of mere malice and revenge, accuse another of the most infamous crimes, might excite against him the indignation of all his fellow citizens by the most atrocious culminies, might disturb, nay, overturn all his domestic peace, and embitter his paternal affections, might inflict the most distressing punishments upon the weak, the timid, and the innocent, might prejudice all a man's civil and political and private rights, and might stir up sedition, rebellion, and treason, even against the government itself, in the wantonness of his passions, or the corruption of his heart. Civil society could not go under such circumstances. Men would then be obliged to resort to private vengeance, to make up for the deficiencies of the law, and assassinations and savage cruelties would be perpetrated with all the frequency belonging to barbarous and brutal communities. It is plain, then, that the language of this amendment imports no more than that every man shall have a right to speak, write, and print his opinion upon any subject whatsoever, without any prior restraint, so always that he does not injure any other person in his rights, person, property, or reputation, and so always that he does not thereby disturb the public peace or attempt to subvert the government. It is neither more nor less than an expansion of the great doctrine recently brought into operation and the law of libel, or libel, rather, that every man shall be at liberty to publish what is true, with good motives and for justifiable ends. And with this reasonable limitation, it is not only right in itself, but it is an inestimable privilege in a free government. So, it, if it damages the reputation, but it's true, and your intent is educating others, there is no crime in that. But if you're doing harm, if it's disturbing the peace or if it's damaging the reputation of someone and it's not true, that's actually a crime. This is something very important to keep in mind. You see that kind of stuff going on in the soap operas on the news all the time, and it's actually criminal. Without such a limitation, it might become the scourge of the Republic, first denouncing the principles of liberty and then by rendering the most virtuous patriots odious through the terrors of the press, introducing despotism in its worst form, something we see going on even today with, with what they're doing. And that's in the actual news against the people. A little attention to the history of other countries in other ages will teach us the vast importance of this right. It is notorious that even to this day in some foreign countries it is a crime to speak on any subject, religious, philosophical, or political, what is contrary to the received opinions of the government or the institutions of the country. However, laudable be the design and however virtuous may be the motive, even to Any madvert or madvert? I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. I'm sorry. Any madvert <clears throat> is past criticism or censor on speak out against. Okay. So even to speak out against previously upon the conduct of public men, of rulers or representatives in terms of the strictest truth and courtesy 
has been and is deemed a scandal upon the supposed sanctity of their station and characters, subjecting the party to grievous punishment. In some countries, no works can be printed at all, whether of science or literature or philosophy, without the previous approbation of the government. And the press has been shackled and compelled to speak only in the timid language which the cringing court Porter, or the Carpatious Inquisitor, should license for publications. The Bible itself, the common inheritance not merely of Christendom, or believers, but of the world, has been put exclusively under the control of government, and not allowed to be seen or heard except in a language unknown to the common inhabitants of the country. To publish a translation in the vernacular tongue has been in former times a flagrant of offense. The history of the jurisprudence of England, the most free and enlightened of all monarchies, on this subject will abundantly justify this statement. The art of printing, soon after its introduction, we are told, was looked upon as well in England as in other countries, as merely a matter of state and subject to the coercion of the crown. It was therefore regulated in England by the king's proclamations, prohibitions, charters of privilege, and licenses, and finally by the decrees of the court of Star Chamber, which limited the number of printers and of presses, which each should employ and prohibited new publications unless previously approved by proper licensors. On the demolition of this odious jurisdiction in 1641, the long parliament of Charles I, after the rupture with that prince, assumed the same powers which the Star Chamber exercised with respect to licensing books, and during the Commonwealth, such is man's frailty and the love of power even in republics they issued their ordinances for that purpose founded principally upon a star chamber decree in 1637 after the restoration of charles ii a statute on the same subject was passed copied with some few alterations from the parliamentary ordinances the act expired in 1679 and was revived and continued for a few years after the revolution of 1688, which would have been with William, Prince of Orange. Many attempts were made by the government to keep it in force, but it was so strongly resisted by Parliament that it expired in 1694 and has never since been revived. To this very hour, the liberty of the press in England stands upon this negative foundation. The power to restrain it is dormant, not dead. It has never con constituted an article of any of her numerous bills of rights, and that of the revolution of 1688, after securing other civil and political privileges, left this without notice as unworthy of care or fit for restraint. This short review exhibits in a striking light the gradual progress of opinion in favor of the liberty of publishing and printing opinions in England and the frail and uncertain tenure by which it has been held. Down to this very day, it is a contempt of Parliament and a high breach of privilege to publish the speech of any member of either house without its consent. It is true that it is now silently established by the course of popular opinion to be innocent in practice, though not in law. But it is notorious that within the last fifty years the publication was convened at, or connived at, rather than allowed, and that for a considerable time the reports were given in a stealthy manner, covered up under the garb of speeches, in a fictitious assembly. 
There is a good deal of loose reasoning on the subject of the liberty of the press, as if its inviolability were constitutionally such that, like the King of England, it could do no wrong, and was free from every inquiry and afforded a perfect sanctuary for every abuse. That, in short, it implied a de despotic sovereignty to do every sort of wrong without the slightest accountability to private or public justice. Such a notion is too extravagant to be held by any sound constitutional lawyer. With regard to the rights and duties belonging to governments generally, or to the state governments in particular. If it were admitted to be correct, it might be justly affirmed that the liberty of the press was incompatible with the permanent existence of any free government. Mr. Justice Blackstone has remarked that the liberty of the press properly comprehended or understood is essential to the nature of a free state, but that this consists in laying no previous restraints upon publications and not in freedom from censor for criminal matter when published. See, you're free to say what you want, but you're not free from the consequences of what you do, including lying, defamation, slander, right? Pretty simple. Every free man has an undoubted right to lay what sentiments he pleases before the public. To forbid this is to destroy the freedom of the press. But if he publishes what is improper, mischievous, or illegal, he must take the consequences of his own termidity. To subject the press to the restrictive power of a licensor, as was formerly done before and since the revolution of 1688, is to subject all freedom of sentiment to the prejudices of one man and make him the arbitrary and infallible judge of all con controverted points in learning, religion, and government. But to punish any dangerous or offensive writings, which when published shall on a fair and impartial trial be adjudged by or be adjudged of a pernicious tendency, is necessary for the preservation of peace and good order of government and religion the only solid foundations of civil liberty but that's after the crime's been committed not not a a pre-crime that you are written for right like these traffic tickets that you get and other things that they have with statutes that you can break and violate when they actually don't even apply to us Says thus the will of individuals is still left free. The abuse only of that free will is the object of legal punishment. And that's the truth in all cases, whether you're traveling, working, or whatever it is you do. Right? Neither is any restraint hereby laid upon freedom of thought or inquiry. Liberty of private sentiment is still left. The disseminating or making of public or, or making public of bad sentiments destructive of the ends of society is the crime which society corrects a man may be allowed to keep poisons in his closet but not publicly to vend them as cordials and after some additional reflections he concludes with this memorable sentence quote so true will it be found that to censor the licentious is to maintain the liberty of the press, unquote. All right, we only have a few more, I believe. It says, De Lomé states the same view of the subject, and indeed the liberty of the press as understood by all England is the right to publish without any previous restraint or license, so that neither the courts of justice nor other persons are authorized to take notice of writings intended for the press, but are confined to those which are printed. And in such cases, if their character is questioned, whether they are lawful or libellous, libellous is to be tried by a jury according to due pro proceedings at law. The noblest patriots of England and the most distinguished friends of liberty, both in Parliament and at the bar, 
have never contended for a total exemption from responsibility, but have asked only that the guilt or innocence of the publication should be ascertained by a trial by jury. All right, says, it would seem that a very different view of the subject was taken by the learned American commentator, though it is not perhaps very easy to ascertain the exact extent of his opinions. In one part of his disquisitions, he seems broadly to contend that the security of the freedom of the press requires that it should be exempt not only from previous restraint by the executive, as in Great Britain, but from legislative restraint also, and that this exemption to be effectual must be an exemption not only from the previous inspections of licensors, but from the subsequent penalty of laws. In other places, he seems as explicitly to admit that the liberty of the press does not include the right to do injury to the reputation of another, or to take from him the enjoyment of his rights or property, or to justify slander and calumny upon him as a private or public man. And yet it is added that every individual certainly has a right to speak or publish his sentiments on the measures of government. To do this without restraint, control, or fear of punishment for so doing, is that which constitutes the genuine freedom of the press. Perhaps the apparent contriety of these opinions may arise from mixing up in the same disquisitions a discussion of the right of the state governments with that of the national government to interfere in cases of this sort, which may stand upon very different foundations. Or perhaps it is meant to be contended that the liberty of the press in all cases excludes public punishment for public wrongs, but not civil redress for private wrongs by calumny and libels. This is simply saying that there is no statute causing punishment for such things. It would have to be by trial, by jury, and for the, the wrong itself, not for a violation of a, a rule. Says the true mode of considering the subject is to examine the case with reference to a state government whose constitution, like that, for instance, of Massachusetts, declares that, quote, the liberty of the press is essential to the security of freedom in a state. It ought not, therefore, to be restrained in this commonwealth. What is the true interpretation of this clause? Does it prohibit the legislature from passing any laws which shall control the, license, the licentiousness of the press or afford adequate protection to individuals whose private comfort or good reputations are assailed and violated by the press? Does it stop the legislature from passing any laws to punish libel and inflammatory publications, the object of which is to excite sedition against the government? to stir up resistance to its laws, to urge on conspiracies to destroy it, to create odium and indignation against virtuous citizens, to compel them to yield up their rights, or to make them the objects of popular vengeance. Would such a declaration in Virginia, for she has on more than one occasion boldly proclaimed that the liberty of the press ought not to be restrained, prohibit the legislator from passing laws to punish a man who should publish and circulate writings, the design of which avowedly is to excite the slaves to general insurrection against their masters, or to inculcate upon them the policy of secretly poisoning or murdering them. In short, is it contended that the liberty of the press is such or is so much more valuable than all other rights in society that the public safety, nay, the existence of the government itself is to yield to it? Is private redress for libels and calumny more important or more valuable than the maintenance of a good order, peace, and safety of society? 
It would be difficult to answer these questions in favor of the liberty of the press without at the same time declaring that such a licentiousness belonged and could belong only to a despotism and was utterly incompatible with the principles of a free government. All right. We might read one more and stop at the, the top of the page there when we get the chance. We'll see. It says, besides what is meant by restraint of the press or an abridgment of its liberty, if to publish without control or responsibility be its genuine meaning, is not that equally violated by allowing a private compensation for damages as by a public fine? Is not a man as much restrained from doing a thing by the fear of heavy damages as by public punishment? Is he not often and as severely punished by one as by the other? Surely it can make no difference in the case what is the nature or extent of the restraint if all restraint is prohibited. The legislative power is just as much prohibited from one mode as from another. And it may be asked, where is the ground for distinguishing between public and private Amissibility for the wrong. The prohibition itself states no distinction. It is, I don't know if that's the right word there. Sorry about that. Amiable, yeah. So we had it right. The prohibition itself states no distinction. It is general, it is universal. Why, then, is the distinction attempted to be made? Plainly, because of the monstrous consequences flowing from such a doctrine. It would prostrate all personal liberty, all private peace, all enjoyment of property, and good reputation. These are the great objects for which government is instituted, and if the licentiousness of the press must endanger, not only these, but all public rights and public liberties, is it not as plain that the right of government to punish the violators of them, the only mode of redress which it can pursue, flows from the primary duty of self-preservation? No one can doubt the importance in a free government of a right to canvass the acts of public men and the tendency of public measures to censor boldly the conduct of rulers and to scrutinize closely the policy and plans of the government. This is the great security of a free government. If we would preserve it, public opinion must be enlightened, political vigilance must be inculcated, inculcated, it must be uh, engendered in and taught, fostered, right? Free but not licentious discussion must be encouraged. But the exercise of a right is essentially different from an abuse of it. The one is no legitimate inference from the other. Common sense here promulgates the broad doctrine sic uter taut ut nun alium latus. Um, I have no idea what that means i'll be quite honest with you the maxim does not mean that one must never use his own property in such a way as to do injury to his neighbor it means only that one must use his property all right well we'll look at that more later it has something to do with not using your property to injure others right so exercise your own freedom as not to infringe the rights of others or the public peace and safety. There you go. Okay. One more and then we'll call that good. It says the doctrine laid down by Mr. Justice Blackstone respecting the liberty of the press has not been repudiated as far as is known by any solemn derision or sorry decision 
of any of the state courts in respect to their own municipal jurisprudence. On the contrary, it has been repeatedly affirmed in several of the states, notwithstanding their constitutions or laws recognized, that, quote, the liberty of the press ought not to be restrained, unquote, or more emphatically that, quote, the liberty of the press shall be inviolably maintained, inviolably maintained, unquote. This is especially true in regard to Massachusetts, South Carolina, and Louisiana. And one thing that we have in the federal constitution, it mentions that the rights of immunities and privileges of the citizens of one state are the rights, immunities, and privileges of the citizens of the several states. They're equal under the law. So you can use the right or privilege or anything enumerated as a benefit to a citizen in any state constitution for yourself uh, with that clause. But it says, nay, it has further been held that the truth of the facts is not alone sufficient to justify the publication unless it is done from good motives and for justifiable purposes, or, in other words, on an occasion as upon the canvas of candidates for public office when public duty or private right requires it. And very, sorry, in the very circumstance that in the constitutions of several other states, provision is made for giving the truth in evidence, in prosecutions for libels for official conduct, when the matter published is proper for public information, is exceedingly strong to show how the general law is understood. The exception establishes in all other cases the propriety of the doctrine, and Mr. Chancellor Kent, upon a large survey of the whole subject, has not scrupled to declare that, quote, it has been become a constitutional principle in this country that every citizen may freely speak, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that right, and that no law can rightfully be passed to restrain or abridge the freedom of the press, unquote. All right, and we will continue next time with section 1884 here. Um, hopefully, this will be edifying for everyone, and we can continue here with our rights and how they should be implemented in our country at some other time. Until then, you have a wonderful day, wonderful week, and we will see you next time. Thank you.